Thank you, Dave. So how many people were here February 22nd for the Delaware Basin Playmaker? Okay, a big shout out to Dave Ensminger and Mike Party for putting that thing on. That was a fabulous event. <laughs> What, what I said then, I had an opportunity to address um, the group, uh, and the world is watching the Permian Basin. The Permian Basin has always been the center of innovation, and we gave a talk on that, Bill DeMiss and I, how it's amazing when you look over the history of the Permian Basin, how so much of the technology the world uses has come from the Permian. So today, I want to thank Mike Raines for the invitation to speak with you today. Yeah, we're good about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. It's called the Great American Carbonate Bank, and I will abbreviate it in places as GACB, because that's a mouthful, but basically it's the Ellenberger Arbuckle Knox Reservoirs. And what's amazing is the surprises that occur in this reservoir, and the number of exciting ways that the unconformity causes hydrocarbon traps. So, this talk began, I was lucky to be a partner with a colleague, with Rick Fritz and um, James Lee Wilson. We put together a memoir, The Great American Carbonate Bank. I think some of you have seen it. And it was a tribute to the great James Lee Wilson, shown on your right, next, standing next to Jerry Lucia. And I was very fortunate I got to write chapter seven, as well as being an editor, and chapter seven was the one about oil and gas. And what made this possible, thanks to IHS, is they provided up-to-date production data. And we're gonna talk a little bit uh, today of some of the key elements in the traps, and also uh, some of the really interesting reservoir imprints. So the salt tippy canoe unconformity, another uh, tongue twister, if you will, is 470 to 460 million years before president. It's the great uh, unconformity on top of the great American uh, carbonate bank. And it's interesting, if you look back through history, APG's literature, unconformities have often been the subject of great attention. Leverson wrote in 1943, you know, they were following on the heels of East Texas Field, and so siliclastics, major truncation traps, woodbine, it totally dawned a new consciousness, a new type of trap, not just anticlines anymore. And then, of course, Larry Sloss talked about the big sequences, and Vail and others have talked about the sequence boundaries. And Tom Ewing, who's here today, I love this quote from Tom, unconformities make traps. Find them. <clears throat> and pursue them. But what is particularly interesting about carbonates is when you have unconformities, the early workers recognized the unconformities in siliclastics, but what we all know who were carbonates, and of course the Permian Basin is hometown carbonates, is that the karst creates all kinds of exciting reservoir fabric and production. And lots of um, surprises. So here's the big picture. So the red circle or ellipse is basically our hydrocarbon world. It's the mid-continent of the U.S. where the Ellenberger Arbuckle Knox produce. But we always, I always like to start with this because it's clear that the equivalent carbonates also occur in Canada and in Greenland. So let's focus in on what I like to call the bread basket. So the Great American Carbonate Bank, everyone's going to recognize these formation names. So the Ellenberger, um, Jerome Bellion, after I show you some of the background slides, we're going to have some outcrop examples of cars. Jerome Bellion is here with us today. He's going to do some animations of the outcrops in El Paso, which I think are absolutely going to be fantastic to see. Oops. So the, this is a heat map, so the green and red and yellow dots are Arbuckle, Ellenberger, Knox production all throughout the mid-continent. And this was one of those things, a map that I had always wanted to make, and I had to get IHS help to do it. So they made available their database, and the red represents the highest 
EUR wells, the highest producing wells. So you can see that central Kansas, let's see if I can get the uh, pointer here. Hang on just a second. We've got a laser pointer. There we go. So up in Kansas, you see a lot of high production producing wells, and of course in the Permian Basin, a lot of high producing wells shown in the yellows and the and the reds. And if you look at the 30 basins where the Arbuckle, Ellenberg, and Knox produce, the two on the left stand out, the Permian Basin and the Central Kansas uplift. And globally, these reservoirs have produced about 7.7 .7 billion barrels of oil equivalent, and about 60% of it is oil. And so back, we, we still are experiencing the oil gas price differential favor to oil. So I like to think that it's always timely to take another look at our Bucko Ellenberger Knox reservoirs. So this is the karst plane at the end of the sock deposition. And this would be equivalent to the 470 to 460 million year before present unconformity. And the, I'm going to show you a schematic cross section from north to south. So we're basically going from up dip across the mid dip of the mid continent and then through the Oklahoma Lockage End and down uh, to the more distal ramp. So here it is in cross section. The red dash line represents that uh, salt tippy canoe unconformity. And here's where the pays are. To me, that's the key. So in the up dip positions up in the north, there are dolomites and sandstones interbedded. And what's amazing is there are shells within those carbonates that make for seals. So it is actually possible to get stack pays in the Prairie du Chien and in some of those up dip sandstones. But for the most part, here are some of the erosional remnants in Ohio and Kansas. The production hugs very close to the top of the unconformity. Here's Ames Crater. This is an astrobleam, believe it or not. I told you there's a lot of ways that the Arbuckle Ellenberg and Ox produce as well. It even has an astrobleam. And over a lot of the main part of the mid-continent where the Ellenberger is all dolomite, you're basically looking at large horse structures, different types of structures. And so there it's very critical to look at the rocks that are on top of the unconformity because they control, let's see if I can go back here. Oops, not sure if I can go back, there we go. The rocks on top of the unconformity in full juxtaposition have a really key impact because the carbonate bank itself does not particularly have proven source rock. If it has any, it's extremely minor. And so one of the key lessons about this carbonate bank is you have to get source rocks external to the bank. So they either have to overlie the bank or they have to be full juxtaposed to the bank. And very interesting, there are a couple of basins, some of that are getting a lot of uh, the Rome trough, for example, where there's Cambrian shells that are underneath the carbonate bank. So those are sort of interesting uh, new elements for adding source rock. And in the Alakogen, uh Hilton Field, for example, there's pay not only in the top of the um, Ellenberger, but also down into the Ellenberger, because it's a very tall structure, and there's a thing called the brown zone. But for the most part, most of the production is along the unconformity. So let's look at a few field examples. I always think if you have a map and a cross-section, you can get pretty far as a geoscientist. So just to, we'll go through a couple of these quickly to give you um, a flavor. I like to do the grand tour and just saturate on fields, because we, a lot of our exploration is analog based. So here's an example in Ohio. There's erosional remnants. The, there it's called the Beekman Town. And you can see, for example, the South Canaan Pool. There's uh, erosional remnants that produce in Ohio. And Kansas, the central Kansas uplift, is very well known for erosional remnants at the top of that unconformity. And what's really interesting here, this is the Gusso type hydrocarbon fractionation. It goes from gas to oil up dip, so you get uh, differential traps. The eastern shelf of the Midland Basin, many of you re may remember Suggs Field. So there's a karst, cave roof, cave fill, cave floor. And what's interesting, over in the eastern shelf, the cave fill is actually an acroclude, so it's impermeable shells. So there's pay 
not just in the cave roof, but also in the cave floor beneath the cave fill. And so there are some interesting stratigraphic prep uh, that happened over there. Oklahoma City Field, giant anticline. The red line represents that sock tippy canoe unconformity and the pay up here. But I, what I wanted to show is that there is another unconformity, the uh, pre-pen unconformity. So it's not uncommon on some of these large structures to have multiple unconformities. And so karst that gets activated gets reactivated. And this, of course, is a very happy situation. This particular the discovery well in Oklahoma City Field made 6,500 barrels of oil a day. That's the kind of stuff that can happen in the Arbuckle-Owen Bourbon Ox. Keystone Field, Central Basin, another example. This is a major structural uplift, and you can see many of the fields on the Central Basin platform. And this happens to be uh, 147 million barrels and uh, half the TCF, very significant field, as many of the fields are. This is Hilton Field. So this is now in Oklahoma in the Alakagen, and you can see that there is an upper Arbuckle Pay, and Arbuckle is equivalent with Ellenberger, of course, and then there is the brown zone. So there's a really tall structure and about a thousand feet from the top of the unconformity. This is one of the few places where there's a huge amount of oil produced farther away from the unconformity. And I'd like to show this slide because um, one of the great stories about Captain Cook is during the early exploration of the South Pacific, people, explorers, would go on pathways and they'd follow the safe routes because they didn't want to get wrecked in a storm. And they stayed on the same path and they very rarely found anything new. But Captain Cook had this thing where he would go and he would definitely get off the path and go in all different directions. And so the point that I like to make out here is he would have liked the Arbuckle Ellenberger Knox because every once in a while, there are some significant out there discoveries. For example, Maven Field. And I just wanted to show you, these are the, the production of the Arbuckle Ellenberger Knox in green and red. Remember our heat map. So here's all the big production in Texas. And here's Wilberton Field, and here's the Ohio production. So there was a significant 1972 Exxon show that made gas, but it was never followed up until 1995. And so people went back in and they recompleted around a significant old show. And they came away with a 50, uh, approximately 52 BCF field with about 9 million barrels of oil. So a very uh, important point because if the petroleum system is in play, I would like to suggest that there are many places where some surprises are still going to happen in the Arbuckle Lohenberger Knox. When I was at Shell as a new hire geologist, I spent my first 14 years there, I got to know a fellow named Bert Tamir, and Bert was the classic Dutch petrophysicist, and he was great friends with Gus Archie. And so I was handed the log. I was working Wilberton Field in the Arcoma Basin. And I was handed the suite of logs, and I was supposed to do an analysis. So I thought I'd better go talk to Bert. And I brought him this, this set of logs, and I, I opened it up, and he looked down tombstone, tombstone, 2% 2 porosity rock. And there were a few spikes of 8 to 10 foot, uh, 8 to 10% porosity. They were 5 or 10 feet thick. And he said, young man, why are you wasting my time with this tombstone rock? And I said, Bert, the well has already produced 50 BCF. And it was shortly after that, Bert retired. <laughs> my point is, complex car system defy classical hole plug type of core analysis. It's very difficult to model the complexity of the situation. So this is one of our favorite diagrams um, from the BEG, and I think everybody's seen this. So the premise is, if you drill a well here, it's, you're going to get tombstone all the way down. And you may be high on structure, you may be on the crest of the structure, but you may be out of luck. This is the kind of well that I showed Bert Tamir. It had a few stringers, and if you added up the pH, you couldn't put 50 BCF in, in those thin stringers, but you can see the rest of the story. You can see that it's tapped into a huge 
system laterally. And of course, now we have some new tools. So a lot of uh, folks are thinking about doing things like horizontal drilling, because if you get into some of these fracture systems, boy, you can tap into an awful lot. And this is an uh, example from CORE of one of the cave fill facies. You can see the chaotic breccia. This is something that I'm sure everybody here has seen, these types of rocks on the FMI images and, and also in CORE. And so being kind of a simple-minded guy, sometimes you don't have 3D seismic, I just went in and I, I've done things like contouring cumulative production. And it works with IPs as well. And the thing that's really interesting about the Ellenberger, and many of you who work the Ellenberger, will probably can attest that there's some really good wells and there's some really bad wells. And sometimes they're right next to each other. And so what I love to show here, this is the crest of Todd Field. It's about a 400 foot incline. It's on the Ozona platform. If the wells here are a few thousand barrels of oil on the crest of the structure of the Ellenberger. It's just, they're just little wells. They could almost even be dry holes or tight wells with shows. But I think in this case, they made a few thousand barrels. But along the crest, there are also two and four million barrel wells in between with tight wells. And this is, I love this well. This is on the flank of the structure, about 300 feet. So the total structure is about 500 feet. This is 300 feet down from the top. It's a 15 million barrel well. And when I hand contoured it, you can almost start to see some linearity. So now, remember that the two places are the Central Kansas Uplift and the Permian Basin. So thanks to Paul Raymond Detta, he shared some of his examples with me where he's gone into Kansas. Remember, there's those erosional remnants. And so what Paul did is he's um, also contoured IPs, and you can start to see some linear patterns. And of course, where I'm going with this is I think that the fractures and the cars are playing a key role. So this is a, another great piece of work by uh, the Bureau. This is Bob Lauks. I remember when I used to lead field trips to shell with a lot of outcrops um, in the early 80s. I showed Bob Lauks this outcrop and we went out together and then he's gone back many times and done some fabulous work. They actually did sparker seismic data and you may recall this is an APG paper, and you can see here, this is what seismic looks like in tombstone. And then as the fabric gets more brecciated and complex, you get more breakup in the seismic. And what's really great, here is the map view, and here's the map view of some of the cave systems. You see some linearity, and this is like exposed and outcrop, so it's a great laboratory. But there are some real life examples of 3D. And so I'd like to thank uh, McDonald. She published this in 2007, the APG Bulletin. These show some dull lines, and you can see some of the karst fabrics in the Fort Worth Basin. So I have a couple of buddies here, Bill Stevens. I know you love going caving, so bear with me. I wanted to just show you a couple of examples of cave patterns. And what, take a look at these four caves from different places. What is it that they seem to share? Now, I would say that the density of the fractures varies, but they all seem to have a linearity, and sometimes they intersect orthogonally or perhaps at different angles, but there is a profound impact on the caves by fractures, and that's true just about everywhere you go. And in fact, every cave you go into, when you start going down, you, you, if you haven't already noticed this, you take out your brunt and take out your compass and you will see linear patterns in the caves. This is another example. This is a vertical profile. And what this is meant to show, this is out of a cave system in Austria. So here in a vertical profile, this is a, a cave system and here is another cave system. And as Jerome's going to show you shortly from the outcrops, it's not unusual in cave systems to have multi-story cave systems. So it just gets more and more exciting. And so this is a karst plateau. There's dolines. And you can see this is the typical karst horizon when carbonates get very uh, weathered and dissolved. And here, guess what? You can see it nicely in an example from uh, Kansas in 3D seismic. Again, uh, thanks to Paul Raymond Detta. 
And so these days, we've got all kinds of new attributes. And so I think that there is a lot of potential to go back and re take a look at new fields. And so I have no doubt a lot of people in this room have 3D data on some Ellen Berger cars. And I'd love, love to visit with you because there's a lot of powerful tools. So just to summarize, these are, I think, the key points. After looking at the 7.7 .7 billion barrels of oil equipment produced out of the Great American Carbonate Bank Reservoirs, with the Ellenberger leading the charge in the Permian Basin and the Center Basin Platform, most of the production comes at or near that unconformity. Fault analysis for a lot of the big structures, particularly where the Arbuckle Ellenberger is old Dolomite, they come out of uh, large structures, but it's really important to do trap analysis. And I have a whole other talk on that we won't get into today. And I would say that it's really key. Hydrocarbon shows in the Ellenberg are really important. And places that are in outlier areas, if they have decent oil or gas shows, I would definitely take another look at those. And so there are places where there may be shows that the well may have just drilled a tight rock. And so there may be potential to explore around it, to look for some areas where there may be more permeable rock and it could yet be connected to unproduced oil and gas. And one of the things that's really amazing as you look at the technology revolution in the Permian Basin, it used to be that water was a problem. But with the ability now to move tremendous amounts of water, a lot of Ellenberg wells, if they had a high water cut, they may have had significant oil, but there may be something still there that could be followed up on using some of the water, uh, ways to handle water today. And we have some new tools. We have seismic and directional drilling. And I also want to say most of the wells, many wells in a lot of areas, only go very uh, a few feet below the unconformity. And there are certain areas, like in the up-dip sandstone dolomite areas, and in some of the uh, more distal settings, where it may be possible to stack Ellenberger potential below the unconformity. And so, and then the, the final thing that's kind of fun is, I love those really source rock rich sub-basins in the Cambrian that are underneath the Ellenberger, because that's the great challenge, is how do you get the oil into the carbonate system. And so you can do it by onlapping on the unconformity surface, you can do it by fault juxtaposition. But some of these Cambrian subbasins are actually potentially pumping oil in underneath them. And some of these Cambrian basins are actually like the Rome trough, is actually being explored for unconventional plays. So with 